All right, well, it's 11.01, so we'll go ahead and get started. I have hit the record button. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm Denise Demisi, Director of Faculty Development for the University System of Georgia. And we are so happy that you all are here for this webinar um, about creating community with your students. I think this is something we all feel like we could use a little more of right now, especially now. Uh, so I'm very happy to have Laura Carruth from Georgia State and Josie Bodier from Georgia Highlands to share this with us. Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, today we're going to be talking about creating community in the hybrid and online classrooms. I'm going to start and Laura's going to jump in in just a few seconds. Oh, she's sorry. I, she's, I'm ahead of myself here. <laughs> so she's sharing the slides with you right now. Okay, so um, I thank you all for coming. As Denise mentioned, you know, it is Friday morning, afternoon, and we appreciate you taking the time to um, learn a little bit about um, Korean community. I have found it to be very interesting in faculty development. I've been in this field, you know, prior to this, I was teaching K-12, but I've been in this field for probably about 13 years now, and I've never seen the numbers of participation like we see now, and I'm so happy to see that people or a faculty are finally figuring out um, who their sources are and, and seeking information if they need it. And I'm sad that it was COVID that brought us to this, but I'm so happy to know that I feel like I'm very seen and very heard now in my profession. And I appreciate that. So thank you all for coming um, to this wonderful webinar with Laura and I. So today we are going to, oops, hang on. I think I lost control. Oh, no, I got it, sorry. <laughs> Today we are, this is our plan for the workshop. So we're going to do a few, a few activities, but really what we're going to talk about is connecting um, you with your students and also the connecting the students together. And then also how are we going to connect? How is that all affected by all of the things that's going on in our world currently right now? So my name is Josie Bodier and I'm the director uh, for the center at the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Georgia Highlands College fairly new to Highlands. I've been there about a year and a half now and really enjoy working at a small college. Um, and Laura and I are sharing our coping mechanisms for uh, COVID over the last couple of months. I have continued to mountain bike, which is a love of mine. If anyone is out there and wants to talk more about that, I'd love to. Um, and uh, reading school, work, and fun. <laughs> That's what I've been doing. And so I'm going to let, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and she's going to take it over for a couple of slides here and then I'll be back in the middle. So um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is Laura Caruth, and I direct the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning at Georgia State University. And very soon, our center is changing names, and we're going to be the Center of Excellence in Teaching and Learning and Online Education. Um, I'm also an associate professor in the Neuroscience Institute. And my area of research is actually focusing on how stress impacts brain and behavior. And as you can imagine, thinking about everything that's happening right now during the pandemic has provided sort of interesting things to consider with regards to faculty and students. And it all ties into how to help create a classroom, um, especially in these sort of much more stressful and anxiety inducing circumstances. Um, I've been dealing with all of this by taking daily walks. So just getting out of the house and getting away from the screen, um, walking a lot. And then every weekend, trying to just get out and uh, experience nature, hiking, um, has been sort of a lot of my stress-reducing activities. Laura, um, I have to ask them to introduce themselves. Yeah. So now what we want you to do is please, in the chat box, um, introduce yourself. So name um, your institution, department, and then also just share something that you've been doing to help reduce your um, stress during this time. And just pop that right into the chat box, please. And I have to open the chat. Oops, I actually went for, which I did not mean to do because I'm trying to find the chat on my controls, but so.
right, so I think answers are popping in. Yes, I am. Um, Josie, can you uh, read off any of those chats for us? Can you see the chats? Or Denise? Yes, I'm sorry, I, have, I was muted. Yes. Yeah, uh, we have someone here from, uh, who teaches cooking. It just flew by me, but now I can't find yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Pamela's here from Perimeter. Hi, Pamela. Monica from Middle Georgia. Uh, Mandy from KSU. Hey, Mandy. Um, Scott Butler from um, Georgia College. Uh, someone is coping by hanging out with their dogs and gardening. April from North Georgia. I'm jealous of the gardening. Uh, we've got Hal from Georgia Southern in kinesiology. Uh, this is great. Columbus State, Greg, he teaches exercise as well. Um, economics coming from GGC. Grace, glad to have you here. She used YouTube workout videos as her coping mechanism. <laughs> Thank y'all for sharing. Lots of walks and yoga, I see. Yeah. Lots of elements related to self-care, which is not surprising, and eating, which is also not surprising. <laughs> so we're basically from across the entire state of Georgia, but we're all trying to deal with this common issue of what's happening now with the pandemic and thinking about how to create positive class climates. Um, what we want to do now is move into um, an activity where we want you to, you're going to be doing this in Padlet and Josie is going to be sharing a link, but we would like you to take first a few minutes to think about what are your worries and concerns about creating a positive class climate in online or hybrid courses, be online but hybrid, and what is this worry based on? So just spend one or two minutes thinking about your answer and then add them to the Padlet. Um, uh, the link will be in the chat box and please include your name. So, um, and this is just also a way to demonstrate that Padlet is a really great app to let students post notes and messages that they can share virtually. Laura, do you want me to pull it up? Do you want me to share it? Yeah, I will stop sharing the PowerPoint and then that way you can pull up the Padlet and share that. So there have been some interesting things. So I've seen students disappearing, which has been common. Um, concerns. Um, I want to feel connected with, you know, students to feel connected with each other, um, issues related to that. Um, these are flying by. Um, you know, students being distracted is also very common. A burnout, faculty and students. Um, love, engagements, uh, students not even trying. Um, Levels of participation, lack of student participation. So a lot of these things are things I hope we can touch on. And what we hope we can do now is model how to support your students in a way that you can use in your Chancellor's Learning Scholar community. And what we hope is that as we go through these different parts of this webinar, you might be able to take a piece of this and actually expand it into a larger workshop or a larger activity for your, uh, your Chancellor's Learning Scholar community. Because what you can do is demonstrate how to create a community within, um, for the, your participants so that they can go back, you can model this and they can go back and try this with their students. But we can see that there's lots of themes. Um, just to say, so some of these folks are Chancellor's Learning Scholars, but it's also, we just have um, general faculty members right. across the system too. So it's, it's quite relevant, I think. Across to everyone. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, so thanks for that reminder, Denise. So the people who are Learning Scholars can adopt some of these things for their programs. But for any of you, it's just thinking about how to make sure that you're connecting with your students. But you can also go back and share this with your colleagues at your home institutions. So what we will do is capture this Padlet and also be able to share it with you later. But I'm going to go back in now and uh, reshare the PowerPoint and move us forward now that we've seen some of these responses. 
So why are we doing all of this? Why is creating community, why this matters now more than ever? Um, and we can all go back and think about what January and February looked like. They felt normal, right? February was feeling pretty normal. Started out like a normal year, um, but that rapid transition to remote teaching was new to faculty and to students. It was many, I don't know anyone who had actually experienced um, anything like that before in higher education or even in K through 12. And the COVID panic of the spring is now what we are calling the new normal. And this is kind of what we put in the chats in the beginning, you know, COVID-19, it is the new normal. How are we adapting to this? So teaching in a socially distanced way has really altered how we are connected to our colleagues our, and connected to our students. And it's altered even our professional identities. And we're all sharing this jointly. This isn't something that just students are experiencing or just instructors, but this is a shared community element at, in higher ed and in K through 12. And anyone um, can, you, you wanna develop a community of support at your institution. Um, and you wanna find ways to help yourself, help your students and work with, to support your colleagues. So connecting with your students. Um, some of the best things to do are to start before class, start before day one. Using your LMS, um, you have ways to engage with your students. Um, so it doesn't, it no longer has to wait to that first face-to-face -face day. So we, you know, sending an email or posting an announcement in the LMS is easy. But a lot of people are saying students don't respond to emails or read them. So what we're trying to do, at least at Georgia State, is consider using things like Slack or GroupMe, a group with your class, because you want to kind of use maybe some of the tools that your students are already using. And some of these social messaging um, platforms are more comfortable for students than maybe logging into their university email. You definitely want to make sure you adopt a learner-centered approach for your class um, and all student communications. And we'll go into what this means more in a few minutes. And then a welcome video, um, especially if you're teaching a hybrid course where you may not see all of your students the first week and maybe they're coming the second week, you still want to make that personal connection with them. So posting a picture of yourself or a video really does make a difference and share information about yourself, you know, maybe where you're from or how long you've been at your institution or teaching a class. Um, it also really shares to remind students Students, or let them know about your teaching philosophy. You know, say, hey, I want to be hands-on, or hey, I, I appreciate connecting with my students in these ways. If you're new to online teaching, let your students know. Um, and also consider a kind of we're in this together message. We are, this is new to all of us, and we're going to make sure that we all together as a class get through this challenging time. And um, it's also fun to include icebreaker surveys, quizzes, or polls. Um, you can use Poll Everywhere, Kahoot, or Slido as great um, tools to accomplish this. And allow students, if they've got something that they need to share with you in order to be successful in your class, have it set up a way where they can share maybe something personal, like, hey, I have this challenge and you need to be aware of it. But also share fun stuff with the class as a whole, but also gather information one-on-one -on -one from students as you need to know it. So um, icebreaker questions can be anything simple, like favorite food. Um, I have a colleague at Georgia State who collects favorite food, and then she puts on her class calendar things like, this is National Ice Cream Day, or this is National Pizza Day for all the people who like those foods. Um, I like two truths and a lie, and maybe you can have it posted, but then as the semester goes on, have people figure out as they get to know the students more what the two truths and a lie are. I've seen good ones related to hopes and fears that faculty have been using at GSU. Like, I hope this semester will be like this. I'm worried about this. Um, and this is just a link for 21 online icebreakers so that you can just sort of adopt for your class. Um, and think about if you can tie any of the answers students have to your courses. Um, that also is a great way to kind of personalize the course. Um, there is a marketing professor at Georgia State who has students tell them what their favorite movies are. And he did this for face-to-face, -face. he's doing it online now. And then he 
because he's teaching marketing, he uses the movies that they share to demonstrate product placement. And then the students loved it, seeing the movies that they had suggested. He would pull it out and say, hey, this, did you ever think about looking at this movie through this lens? Um, and it also connects personally with the students. Um, and you can add new icebreakers during the weeks um, as the semester moves forward. Um, and Josie will talk about that in, in a few slides. But what we really do want to encourage is the use of learner or student-centered language. Um, this is going to be language that describes the behaviors that students need to demonstrate and to be successful in a course. So this is describing the positive behaviors, such as successful students will do this. Um, it, 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 fo it focuses on being proactive um, and what you, what you want your students to start doing on the first day of class instead of being written as something that will penalize them if they don't do a certain behavior. Um, this language is important in all teaching modalities, but it's really important, especially in asynchronous online classes, where you're not gonna have as many, if any, opportunities to engage with students in real time, to interact with them, and maybe to remind them about certain um, elements that they need to do to complete an assignment or turn something in. Um, so a learner-centered syllabus just adopts this approach in the syllabus and it really does focus on um, the needs of students and the learning process. Um, it's, as I already mentioned, that learner-centered language is more important in asynchronous classes. Your syllabus becomes even more important in online courses and in hybrid courses because you may not have that syllabus day time on the first day of class to walk them through what it is that they need to do and look at. So you now need to find a way to make them engage. And there is research to show that students read learner-centered syllabi more carefully than they might read a more negative syllabus. And I know there's always a complaint that why, you know, students don't read the syllabus, but you can also have one of your points, the importance of reading and engaging in the syllabus. Um, and include any information that will facilitate how the success of your students, you know, so you want to provide information on where to go to get the resources that they need. Um, there's a lot of research on syllabus and class climate. Um, this is just one paper from 2002, but th this, these studies have been replicated and then published um, in additional um, journals since then. But just looking at language and punishing versus encouraging language, there was definitely a difference in how students perceived the approachability of their instructors. And instructors with punishing wording were rated as less approachable. And students were less likely to seek out help from these instructors if they read a syllabus and they thought it actually seemed scary or uninviting. They didn't wanna to go to office hours and they didn't wanna ask questions. And this is really important for underclassmen um, and first generation students. They're very much affected by the wording. If they read something and they think that they cannot do well with it, they often just check out automatically. And so think about who the students are at your institutions and how language is going to be very important in feeling, making them feel welcome and uh, that making them feel like they can be successful. So these are just some examples. So um, if for some substantial reason you cannot turn in your papers or take an exam at the scheduled time, you must contact me prior to the due date or test date or you will be graded down 20%. Can anybody just unmute or type in the chat box one simple way that we could turn this from punishing into a more encouraging language? Feel free to unmute and chime in or type it in the chat box, um, which hopefully I'll be able to see. I'm in the chat box, so thanks. Oh, good, thanks. Long. I think if you make it something where in your rubric, you 20% of the grade is for turning it in on time as opposed to a punishment. Okay, so um, Mary Lynn has suggested that we use, you're getting credit for, for turning it in on time, 
Okay. Do it. Does anyone else have any other um, recommendations? In the chat window, we've got a couple of people suggesting to use the word please. It's always nice to be polite. Absolutely. So, um, let's see. Yeah. Here's one. If you miss the assignment, you still have a chance to earn 80% of the grade if you contact me in advance. Yeah. And, and, and that kind of gets it right here. So yeah. one, we can adopt what Mary Lynn said is also just say, hey, you know, there's some points for just for getting this done. That probably works really well with, you know, underclassmen. But this is just changing. And one, focusing on you get 80 points. So this comes straight from positive psychology research. Tell somebody what they can get instead of telling them what's going to happen if they don't do it. Mm -hmm. And that our brains respond to this in a very positive way. And also, um, you should, changing the should. So, you know, um, and you can add please in here if you want to do that. That's also, that's also very nice. But just these simple kinds of changes are also very important with regards to um, learner-centered language and sort of approachability. Hey, Laura. Yeah? Now, I, teaching comp at any level, I, I, for due dates on essays, I always put in there something about the earlier, the better, because you'll be able to receive more feedback. So this idea of I'm yeah. doing this early in order to get something. Yeah. That, that seems to motivate students pretty well. Yeah. That's great, Jeff. And what you could do is say, if you want feedback before the due date, turn it in early so that yeah. you can actually revise, self-correct, right. and then you submit. So, um, so that's also a great way to do this as well as to say, because what we're hearing about now is that students are waiting until that deadline right before it's due to get something turned in. And so Jeff's recommendation also helps with those other skills we're trying to encourage our students to develop. So, and with this, um, we want to think about just sort of why we want a learner-centered uh, learner syllabus language in, the, uh, in, in general. And so, you want to connect with your students. You want, you, you need to have a syllabus, right? We, we have to have one, but you can set the tone. It sets the tone for the entire semester. And it's very hard to go back and undo something at the beginning of the semester that didn't work. And by having a positive, positive language, it's setting the tone for um, the behaviors you want your students to have and more opportunities for them to be successful. You can describe your beliefs about learning if you want to in your syllabus or just include that in your welcome video. Um, a good syllabus sets up the structure and organization of a course. You know, you guys all know this already, but it's even more important in online and hybrid courses to have very good structure and very good organization and not to change or make drastic changes. You can link to things, so it's one easy place that students can go to and, and launch to, to assignments in the LMS. But it also can include just defining what they need to do to be successful. So this is truly getting at the elements of a learner-centered syllabus is information on study time, and we'll talk about that. Information on uh, resources to help them be successful, tutoring centers. I think it's also important to help determine their readiness for a course. Um, let them know, hey, these are the things we're going to cover and make sure that you have reviewed these kinds of elements, you know, background information they may need to rely on their prior knowledge to be successful. It also helps to fit it into the overall curriculum. You know, sometimes students say, I don't get why I'm in this course. Well, now you can describe this. Um, and connect to the, uh, any of your campus resources, both in-person and virtual resources to help your students be successful. Um, and you, sometimes a syllabus reads as a contract, as a legal document, but maybe you could think about it more as a learning contract and say, hey, I'm gonna do these things to help you learn and I need you to do these things in order to meet me halfway so that you actually engage in your own learning. So having it serve as a learning contract is also a really important thing that you can do um, in any of your courses. And I'll now transfer over to Josie. Thanks, Laura. So I'm gonna continue talking a little bit about the syllabus here. Um, another idea is to, oh, let's make sure I can. Mm. Oh, do you need to say? Yeah, I have to request again. Okay, there you go. I have approved your request. There you go. <laughs> Thank you is to talk is to share um, with students in the syllabus 
what success looks like in your class. So this isn't, sorry, my puppy dog is visiting, of course. Um, what success looks like in your class. And so we want to tell them uh, what we expect of them in this way, instead of just listing out, do not do this, do not do this, do not do this. Maybe rewording it in a way that says, for example, here you see finding information, uh, an example for finding information. Successful students look up information first, et cetera. And there's two bullet points on what successful students do when they're finding information in this particular class. Uh, something else that I really like, I've seen in syllabi, um, a learning center syllabi specifically, is a list of um, my expectations of you and your expectations of me. So we're creating that partnership in learning and that is very learner centered. That is to say to the student that I, you can expect these things from me as well as I'm expecting these things from you. And it's, it's the things you've always done. Go to class, be prepared for both of you. Um, you're gonna respond to their emails in the time you've asked, you know, you've told them that you will respond to their emails. Um, they're going to be respectful. You're gonna be respectful. They're gonna turn their things in on time. You know, that, those types of things, but it's in that wording of creating that partnership with them. The students, it really resonates with them when they start to see these kind of um, non-traditional components to a syllabus. They really, you know, draws their eye to them. I had someone in the, in the chat ask me for example, make sure, oh, the last bullet, sorry, make sure you tell the students, you know, when you're going to contact them and when you will reply to their emails and how to do, where to do that, et cetera. But I had someone in the chat window that said, can you provide an example of a learner center syllabus? And of course I can. There is a wonderful uh, project out there um, that University of Virginia has put out. If you Google University of G Virginia and learner center syllabus, you'll find it. They have a wonderful rubric and they have tons of examples. Uh, we did a wonderful research project on this when I was at KSU for about two years and um, saw great uh, progress in student and sorry, in faculty syllabi. So check that out and contact me if you need anything. I'll be happy to share. So another thing we wanna put in our syllabus, especially now, is this information about technology. We need our students to know um, what special access they have to find, like a publisher site or maybe an OER that they're using, an open educational resource that they're using in the class. We need them to also know if microphones or webcams are necessary, like for proctoring a test or for having synchronous discussions like this. Um, talk to them about where to get we free Wi-Fi there's plenty of opportunities now for that. And also if, if there's a uh, opportunity for checking out technology at your institution. And then finally, also make sure they know who to contact for help because you're not necessarily the, you're not necessarily the tech support. There's gotta be someone else out there that does the tech support <laughs> at your organization. And then, we, were you clicking for me, Laura? <laughs> Somebody was clicking for me. Y'all tell me to hurry up. <laughs> Okay, so also in your syllabus, you want to include your due dates and organization. This usually looks like a schedule or a calendar for your students. So we want to be um, clear and specific about those expectations. Some people say it's very hard to do that. Um, however, there's no other, there's no better way to teach your students time management or um, other skills in organization than to provide them the expectations for their materials, their assignments, their assessments for the entire semester. You can do that. Um, think about this, this question right here, the second bullet here, um, something that Laura brought up to me and I had never really thought about it. What message are we giving if everything is due at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night? And are all the due dates the same for all the other professors? And are you hearing students say like, oh, I have so much due today. It's always Sunday at 11.59. It's always Monday at 8 a.m. What are we telling our students about that? Like I'm looking in the chat window to see. Yeah, we're hearing too that students are logging in for something that's due and trying to complete five hours worth of work in 45 minutes. And, def, you know, there's no magic that will allow that to happen. So, you know, so this is something we're experiencing at Georgia State with these ideas of the once a week. Think about, deadlines. think about when are they doing tech updates to your stuff? You know, you don't want to mm -hmm. you know, work around that. When are you actually going to grade these items and get them feedback on that? Are you going to grade it at, you know, one o'clock in the morning on Monday? No, you're not. Um, think, also think about like, when are you going to get the most questions from your students about all of these assignments that are due? And if it's going to be over Saturday and Sunday, make something due on Monday then. Um, it doesn't always have to be, you need to be consistent in your due dates, don't get me wrong, 
but you can do several due dates during the week and consistency with that, or, you know, thinking about a Monday or Tuesday to start your week. It doesn't always have to end and start on a Sunday. Yeah, and, and these are called Cinderella deadlines. I just read a really yeah. good article. Yeah, yeah I saw yeah. it. Yeah, that was good. It was Cinderella deadlines was on a, ooh, I can't remember where it was. I'll look I it up while you're talking. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say the Chronicle, but I don't know. Um, and then remember, uh, you know, to seek out the campus support for all the other resource links that you need for tech support, et cetera. Um, when you're, when you're creating that schedule for the students, I talked about the remind app. That was an idea that you can use to send out reminders to students. Um, it's, an, it's a free app and it's easy to use. Um, low caution about, um, putting our students on camera. So a lot of us do have that as a requirement for our classes and I can understand why that might be. Um, just be aware of some of these things that I'm about to tell you. Students have a lot of anxiety and feel very uncomfortable on camera sometimes. A lot of adults do as well. I think our faculty have gotten a lot better about being recorded now that we're in this mode that we're in. But, you know, th it's nothing to, um, to not listen to. Students uh, do have anxiety, don't want to be on camera. They're not in a great space. They're in a closet, a car. I mean, uh, you know, we've seen it all. I'm sure. <laughs> so let's give them an opportunity to not turn on their camera. And what does that feel like? And then also considering the bandwidth issues, of course, when you're running your video along with all the other audio in your house and then maybe, you know, two or three other people in your house also doing the same thing, it's going to really pull on your bandwidth. Um, so let's be, let's be conscious of that. <laughs> I keep, sorry, I keep trying to move my little thing around and it keeps meaning I'm clicking you forward. I apologize. <laughs> It's okay, you're doing it at the right time. <laughs> okay, so next up, I want to finish up uh, two more things about the syllabus. Uh, one include is, uh, oh, sorry, one thing you can include is, well, this wasn't it. It was, um, we, hang on, can you go back a few? I, for some reason, I can't, I don't have my clicker anymore. Yeah. There we go, go, there we go. Okay, hang on. Okay, here we go. Well, okay. So student choice in the syllabus. We wanna make sure that students have, if there's an opportunity for them to have some autonomy or control in the class, that's gonna help motivate them, feel ownership and do better. And so a couple of ideas with giving them choice is I love this idea is um, giving them a choice about your virtual office hours. And again, maybe not even calling them office hours, calling them something like drop-in hours, check-in hours, explaining to them what those hours are supposed to be used for, because they think it's more like coming to the principal's office and actually coming for help. So um, make it, allow the students to make that schedule for you. Like, you know, you can do a doodle or something like one of those, what, what time is good for you kind of uh, surveys and find out what's best for the class and have the class vote on those hours. Um, you could also give them choice in the assignment due dates. We've kind of talked about that a little bit. Um, you know, when do they want something due? When do they, and that's a good survey question to ask. And then um, also assignment choices. And of course, this probably works better in an upper division class, but having them uh, have a choice in um, how they're going to prove their learning to you, how they're going to show mastery to you. Is it going to be in a paper or an exam or is it a different type of project? Um, someone mentioned on the in the chat, they had they were making um, Spotify, um, so music playlist um, for one of their courses, having their students do that. I thought that was a very um, authentic um, and unique assessment. And then finally, another way you can have students get involved is to um, give, is to cr together create rules of engagement in the online discussions, um, breakout room discussions. So what are those rules? How do we engage? How does the discussion happen? Who's responsible? for the um, share out and things like that. So um, continuing in the syllabus, we've got um, an opportunity sometimes to get advice from our former students. And so this is a way for you to stay connected with your students in that way, but also st students can connect at this point with each other. So, so somehow developing an opportunity for uh, audio or video or written testimonials from your students that you can post in your syllabus or in your LMS and we give you two great prompts there, what I wish I knew when I started this class or what I did to be successful in this class. Um, and have them do that before the end of the semester um, and then use it for your next semester or the next time you teach that class. And we also need to be very clear about, um, and this is the last thing that, goes, that we're talking about with the syllabus, um, academic honesty and how it happens 
in your class specifically and at your institution. So you need to make sure that in the syllabus and, and when you're speaking to students, you explain the what and the why. What does academic honesty mean and why am I doing it? So here's an example um, where it explains uh, cheating and plagiarism, plagiarism can not only result in a poor grade and penalties, but it can cause your mentors and peers to mistrust you. So it's explaining why this is important to the students. It's a great take on um, academic um, integrity. And then we also want to be clear and explicit about specific things like group me or slack and how that might be a violation of an academic honesty policy. So what, not only what your institution asks, but what specifically applies to your content, your class, and tell them why. We know students want to know purpose. We know that purpose drives their motivation. They want to know why. What's in it for them? Okay, and then let's shift a second. S semester has now started. You, you know, you, you've prepared your class, you've prepared your syllabus, you've got, you're ready in your mindset and your, and your semester starts. And so now it's time to start adopting some of these instructional strategies into the learning process, using those learner-centered uh, components that we've been talking about with the students. One way to be clear and transparent about um, your expectations is to make sure that all of your assi assignments are written using this tilt method. And you can Google that if you're not familiar, but it is linked here and you'll get the link. Um, but TILT is uh, transparency in learning and teaching and it is a way for us to design assignments so that we are clear about the purpose, about the task they're doing and the criteria that, uh, that we're gonna grade them on. And then we also wanna make sure that those instructional strategies, those learners and strategies are, are inclusive and um, respectful. We need to go back a slide. <laughs> There we go. Inclusive and respectful of all students and all learning happening in the classroom. Um, we've already talked about being consistent in the course design. The one I did this, the webinar I did this semester, I talked all about course design and consistency in that one. Um, but you need to make sure that your modules and your LMS are consistent and that your expectations in a synchronous session are consistent and that whatever you do in the face to face classroom is consistent and students know what to expect in that way. Be organized, this is a great tip. Don't change any dates or assignments unless it benefits all of the students, love that. And then also make sure that when you are doing your lectures online now, instead of face-to-face, -face, that we are chunking them in like 10 minute segments because there's many reasons why, but it really does help a student not just manage their time, but reduce anxiety when they see they only have to watch three 10 minute videos to get through the week instead of one 30 minute video. I know you're saying to me, well, they can press pause and come back to it. They can, but they can also know that they don't have to do that. If they could just get through that 10 minutes, then they could cook dinner, put the kids to sleep, go back and watch another 10 minutes. And that means that, oh, tomorrow I only got to do that last 10 minute one. I mean, they're just checking stuff off that list and mentally I'm sure Laura could talk about this when it comes to brain science. They're just, it's an achievement after an achievement. It's like that low stakes, no grade, um, positive reinforcement that they're just, chunk, you know, moving through that course, getting things done, making them feel better about all that stuff they have to do. And finally, don't forget to provide them with some type of way to take notes, maybe skeleton notes or, or outlines to be active during that watching. There's lots of information out there about that. Okay. Okay. Uh, once the semester starts, we wanna be present and responsive. You don't have to be there 24-7. Uh, we wanna reach out. Laura has talked about this already with reminders and announcements. Use your intelligent agents built into your LMS. Those are the things that we can set for notifying students if they didn't do well on a test, reminding them about some supplemental resources. Maybe they haven't checked in in enough day, in a certain amount of days. Maybe they've missed an assignment. We can set all that up on the back end and students can be notified as they are um, on their LMS, on their devices about those things. So let's see what else. I don't wanna have to, I don't wanna repeat. Oh, make sure <laughs> once the semester starts, especially right now, mid-semester, do a check-in, do a, um, um, just a, a mid-semester evaluation of where the class is, take the temperature of the class. That's what I was trying to say. Ask them what's going well, what's not going well, what can I do to improve your learning? Ask them simple questions, open-ended, where they could give you really good feedback about what, what path they're on in the class, if they're learning, and what you can do to help them. And then 
when you make a change, make sure you refer it back to that feedback. Let them know you've listened to the feedback and here now I'm, I'm making a change based on what you've asked. It's a lot of buy-in with the faculty. They start to trust you. This is what we need them to do to be motivated. Okay. Um, I know I'm talking a lot. I'm trying to, get, I'm trying to make sure we include it all. Um, making sure that you provide, this is back to the syllabus or maybe in your LMS or just in your general um, conversations with students. You wanna make sure you provide diversity inclusion statements in your syllabus. You want students to see who and what you believe in by, based on what you put out there. And, and so, um, you know, even though it might not be a requirement of your institution that you include a statement for international students, a statement for LGBT students, a statement for um, learning support students, you know, it may not be a requirement, but because you're putting it out there, you're showing the students what type of instructor you are. And so they will know if they can come to you, if you're that safe space for them to come to for other questions beyond content or just for content questions. GSU has a great set of example statements linked here. They also have a list of six questions so you can develop your own diversity statement, which I think is wonderful. I'm going to have to do. <laughs> Not that we don't have a great one already. No, I need to practice. <laughs> And finally, I want to leave you with um, this piece of information. Our colleague, Jamie Landau from Valdosta State wrote a wonderful article at Inside Higher Ed in August. And it talked about how teaching with a face mask face-to-face, -face, if you haven't done it yet, it's tough, really dehumanizes that classroom. It really sterilizes it. And from the instructor standpoint, um, you're, you, know, you can't see anything happening with the students. You don't, under, you don't see a smile. You don't see a frown. You don't see anything. It's very blank. And then from the other side, they're, they're getting a muffled voice and they're not getting an expression from you. So what can we do in the class to build that in? Uh, we could do some temperature checks with emojis. And then she also suggested, um, there's other ideas in the article, but she suggested creating a caring class constitution where the students come together to uh, embrace what's happening, empathize with each other, figure out ways to discuss with social distancing, making sure everyone's wearing their mask properly, hand sanitizing, all of that stuff, but creating a constitution where the class agrees to these things. So go back and check it, uh, check it out, check out that article with um, Jamie. Okay, back to Laura, I believe. Or is it back to Laura? Oh, you're muted. So I learned something interesting about Zoom is because uh, Josie and I are sharing controls, anywhere I click on the screen advances the slides. Even if I'm muting and unmuting, you can advance the slides. So, so just be prepared when you're teaching your class that anything weird can happen with anything with technology. So I was trying to mute my dog barking and I advanced the slides. So, but what we are gonna do now is transition into our second activity and what we want you to do, and I also cannot open the chat box because I advanced the slides. So, yeah. So, um, but what we want you to do is think about how you can adapt your face-to-face -face class to an online or, or hybrid format in the, to support a positive class climate. I know some people have already put great things in the chat, but what we'd like you to do is think about this for a minute, uh, type your response in the chat box, but then we will tell you when to hit enter so that we can start, we can sort of capture all of these at once. So just think about how you can adapt your face-to-face -face class, um, anything you do into an online format to support positive class climate. And Josie, if I open the chat, I will advance the slide. So, but you seem to be able to do that. Yeah, I got you. I'm, I'm, I'll, read, I'll read for you. It's really weird. Like if I go up here. Uh-huh. I can see your cursor too. Yeah, it's weird. It will advance the slide. All right, so. So we've got Colin that talked about using Flipgrid, which is. Okay, yeah, so everybody can hit submit now. So go ahead, because it sounds like people are already posting, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to start at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Colin was talking about Flipgrid, which is similar to um, yeah. VoiceThread, if you're not familiar. A weekly ref reflection post from students updating me on how they're doing, um, VoiceThread, uh, implementing polling apps in face-to-face. -face. 
you know, it's interesting. I have gotten some feedback from faculty that said they now see that the online class is more engaging than the face-to-face -face class. That's very anecdotal, but I thought, wow, that's a great research project to do right now. Quick personalized response to student questions and concerns. Discussion boards so students can ask questions in an anonymous format. Weekly announcements using Jamboard. I haven't done that yet. Oh, another one using Jamboard in class instead of having them write on a whiteboard. Great. I hate to interrupt this discussion, but I, I know that the chat's going to get lost. There were a few requests for that diversity and inclusion um, statement earlier from GSU. I tried to find it myself, but Laura, do you have a link to it? Yeah, and the link is in the slides. I'll send it at the end, but it, okay. if you search GSU CETL, um, diversity, I'll try to in, find or, or, or constructing a syllabus, GSU CETL, it, it'll pop up. So it's okay. on our CETL website at Georgia State. Awesome. And I will tell you, we collected these from other places. This is nothing new that GSU has created. We worked with groups from other institutions and faculty shared theirs. So, yeah. Oh, this is a great one. Inviting a student to read from her essay to others about a topic that they were discussing that week. Oh, that was Jeff. Hey, Jeff. <laughs> Visible oh. and present. So, so you guys are sharing great, great ways to keep your students con collect, uh, connected. And it sounds like things that you can do synchronously, asynchronously, as well as in person yeah. in either your hybrid or just your regular face-to-face -face classes. Yes. And it's all about connecting people together. That's what we want to think about. Let me interrupt. And with Monica just talked about exactly that common themes for final essays. Oh, I like that a lot. That's great. Um, and what we want to do now is we talked about connecting you as an instructor to your students, but now we want to transition and think about connecting your students together because not only are they learning from you and sharing and you're sharing with them, but they need to connect with each other as well. Um, that is part of some of the skills that we're helping them develop. Um, is, is having that connection and being able to work together. So you wanna, um, if you can share the fun facts that you collect at the beginning with the course, you know, with everyone, it's not just information for you, but you can share it with your class, make it available. Um, someone had already mentioned VoiceThread. Um, we have that built into our LMS at Georgia State and it is fantastic. Students are able to share and annotate videos or messages um, and it's a really good tool. And they seem to also be very comfortable using it. Make sure both with your diversity and inclusion statement you have this, but also when students engage with each other that we include info on preferred names and pronouns. And I've seen several of you have included that in your name here and I love that. And that's what you wanna just adopt and do. Um, we already talked about the rules of engagement for online courses, but if those even need to change and have them talk to each other about the importance, because one student might be more sensitive that something that comes up that should be discussed than others, and they need to have the chance to explain their perspectives. And these are just some tools to help connect students together with either connected to the content or separately. I'm a huge fan of perusal, and we're working at GSU to get this built into our LMS. This is an e-reader um, that allows students to remotely annotate and share information or respond to course readings. So one thing I used to always hear is my students don't read before class. Well, now you can use something like perusal and have them work together to go through a reading and comment and annotate on it. And it's very interactive and engaging. Other tools, and you can add the Jamboard to this as well, um, Nearpod to make interactive videos. It's kind of similar to VoiceThread. Flipgrid, um, students are, are using that very successfully in lots of uh, classes at Georgia State, as well as Padlet um, to collect information and share. But what you do want to do is if you have and you're using these tools, you also want to remind students about sort of the best behaviors and things that they can put into these um, into these elements, as well as just using the discussion boards in your LMS. So connecting your students together. Um, consider holding weekly check-ins. We already talked about virtual drop-in hours. 
but maybe schedule something where students can just come in together to talk about the class that you're not the driver, that they're in there to engage with each other. Um, and maybe record them and post them for students who aren't there if you're answering questions or consider it just being a neutral space where they can pop in and share something that isn't recorded. Um, I loved this example, which is set up a positive news board in your class where students can share any good news. And right now I think we need all the good news we can get. So this can be, hey, I just found out this, you know, this happened, you know, in my family, or they can share study tips and just connect. And you can do that through Padlet or Flipgrid as well. It's just a way for students to share that good news. Um, one thing I miss from teaching face-to-face -face are those kind of golden minutes at the very beginning of my class or the very end where some of the shyer students may ask questions or engage or you can just have a more casual interaction with your class. And both of these elements let you capture those connections with your students that you may be missing by not getting to see them as frequently in person. It's just sort of those really nice times right before or right after your class. Um, and we also want to expand this beyond the content we're teaching into, we're trying to teach during times of uncertainty. Um, I know at Georgia State, our students have really wanted our support in dealing with elements related to Black Lives Matter, social unrest, police brutality, and even elements related to COVID-19. Um, and that's not my area of expertise. I can't be teaching in something like that. But what I can do is let them know I'm listening to them, I care about them, and share resources for them. At Georgia State, we had these difficult conversations forums at the beginning of the semester for faculty. And we also held these for students. And these links take you to resources that we collected as well as to first day activities to let students know that, hey, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna talk to you about things. Um, currently, students are bringing up things in courses of concerns related to the political climate and elements like that. I'm not saying you're teaching this, I'm not saying you have to address it, but what you can do is share information on where to go um, with your students. And then these are links that um, Josie and I are sharing, the GSU fall plan resources, which takes you to other elements, as well as Georgia Highlands um, remote instruction information. Because what you wanna do is just find resources that fit your teaching personality and you feel like you can share with your students. Um, because it doesn't always have to be about the content, but you also don't need to push this if your students aren't responding. But we did hear especially over the summer, that there were students who were frustrated that their instructors didn't recognize that this course was happening in this other world of, of sort of uncertain times and that they, they were not comfortable with the idea that, hey, we're just gonna pretend it's all normal. Um, and so you just need to be aware that your students are juggling all of these elements like we are during this time of uncertainty um, and let them know that there could be resources to help them. So what I want you to do is we just have these kind of silly mini cases, but if, a, if an, a colleague is to come with you or you were to hear about something, what kind of advice could you give them? So case A is uh, Dr. Who is a busy science professor. She's not taught online before. Her fall 2020, she decided to give twice a week full length synchronous lectures and then post the recordings online. And her class only consists of these posted lectures and two multiple choice exams. So what advice would you give her to rethink her course and trying to create a more positive class climate? And I'm hoping somebody will unmute and just say, hey, I think maybe this other suggestion should be considered. Well, she should definitely break it down a little bit more, right? Instead of just two exams, more exams, more, more chances for assessment and maybe something that also engages the students a little bit more than a multiple choice exam. Um, in addition, break down the lectures into topics, 10 minute, 15 minute videos that should do the trick. Yeah, so those are just great pieces of advice. Thank you so much because that's it. There's no engagement and you're, what you're replicating here are bad practices in a face-to-face -face class and you're replicating them in an online class, which is actually gonna make them probably even worse for students. 
So right, break those lectures down, add more engagement, give students more opportunities to have chances to be successful in the class. So that's great advice, is just trying to, trying to adopt those strategies. And the thing is, they're not hard to do. These are simple things that can be adopted and they may feel like more work up front, but you'll actually find out you get better, um, you get better products. I hate using that term, but you get better outcomes for your students by adopting those, those elements. Um, case B is Dr. Austin is an overworked literature professor. He's nervous about technology and never used his campus LMS much before. However, he did some training over the summer and now wants to use the class discussion boards. He plans on having his students respond to two weekly readings in the discussion boards and respond to at least two other students' posts. What advice would you give him about effectively using the discussion board or any other tool like Padlet or something? So what do you think about Dr. Austin? Someone in the chat wrote, oh, Mary Lynn wrote, case B. This is a tough question. These discussion boards can really be difficult to manage and not have, um, and not have to go badly. Um, she's absolutely right. So you have to read through all of these, right? And make sure and, and provide, because some of, you've got to provide feedback, especially if students aren't going in the right direction, because they're going to think, oh, hey, uh, they, they could keep replicating something that might not be quite right. Someone else suggested that Dr. Austin needs to set up two times during the week to respond or at least add comments into the discussion board to help move things along. Yeah, so he's got the right idea for engagement, but maybe it, you don't also want your engagement to be over the top and unmanageable. So it could be ways to build in sort of more effective things. And maybe it's not always the discussion board, but other ways that you can see something in which students can engage. Um, also, it does, so this is anecdotal from Georgia State students, but they seem to be kind of nervous in one sense about the discussion board. Because in a face-to-face -face class, when you're talking, you can say it and it's out there, but that was less effort than writing it in a discussion board where they feel a little bit more insecure maybe with their writing abilities or it feels like it might take more time. So also teach your students how to effectively use these. Say maybe use a discussion board and get three basic points that you wanna have down. Um, because you don't wanna make it so that this, is a time management issue and that you also cannot provide the feedback that you want. But you still at the same time want to want to have students engage in this way. Yeah, so. a lot of, we had two people suggest breaking up the big discussion boards into um, smaller groups or topic discussions led by students if possible. Yeah, absolutely. So these are great suggestions. So what I'm saying is use these, but use them in a way that you find will be more effective than all of a sudden having the sort of snowball effect that you're now so far behind on reading the discussions. Um, students are now no longer engaging because they can't tell if you're, you're reading their, their prompts. So he's trying to do the right thing and you just need to kind of make sure that you're working um, and, and doing it in a way that will be the most effective. So what you want to consider sort of now and th through this semester and later, um, I'm very interested in the idea of sort of trauma-informed pedagogy framework. Um, part of this is just based on the research I do in neuroscience, but part of it too is we are all experiencing different elements of coping and stress right now. Um, and keeping in mind that students and your colleagues will respond to what you do differently depending on their coping styles and their different early life experiences. And there are some students that we call um, hypo responders. And what that means is they may have had previous trauma well before COVID-19 hit so that once they're dealing with COVID-19, it is almost too much and they completely check out. And you may think, oh, well, they're just not responding because they're not interested. And it could be something else where they are now well beyond their bandwidth of being able to um, handle the additional stress or this new teaching, a learning modality for them for online classes or st stress at home. So just keeping in mind that we're, we're teaching in a time of, of much more amplified stress is, is important to know. And also learning styles. 
a lot of students think that what they may do to be successful in a face-to-face -face class will transition automatically into a different learning modality, either hybrid or online. And sometimes they need to know that it might not work perfectly that way and that they need to figure out how they will learn in your class, um, which is why it's really important to include learning resources in your syllabus. Um, so just letting them know that, hey, this may have worked for you this way, where you were with me face to face and I could keep you more engaged, but reminding them about how they will engage um, will be important. And then also in every class, every way we wanna teach, we really do wanna set our learning environments up to support student metacognition, helping them become self-directed learners. Um, that could be through the note-taking guides that Josie mentioned earlier, or you could use exam wrappers as, they work effectively in face-to-face -face classes, but they work great in online classes where after students take the exam, they go in and, and answer a little survey connected to the, to the exam. So things that you can do to help set up metacognition um, are really, really important. Um, these are just um, some references and resources from where we um, collected this information. Uh, Magna Commons, the faculty focused newsletter is a free newsletter that you can all sign up for and you can get the daily newsletter in your um, email box. Some of the learner centered information we grabbed straight from one of their newsletters. We are all fans of how learning works seven research based principles for smart teaching it especially has wonderful information on student metacognition. Uh, small teaching online has great resources um, as well. Uh, Jamie Landau's article in Inside Higher Ed. Um, I got the info on that positive message board just from Better Lesson, the Better Lesson blog. So they had some great tips and tools for positive classroom culture. Um, we just, some of the logos we used were from Presentation Go. So if you want to find a way to up your PowerPoint game, you know, they've got some great logos you can use. And then we shared all of these with you as well. Padlet, um, Flipgrid, you know, you can use Kahoot or per Perusal. But the word of caution is don't adopt every single one. So make sure that everything you do is manageable for your students um, and that the links to get to these would be links built within the LMS and that they're not also having to log in somewhere else and that they then don't feel like they were um, juggling uh, too many elements to your course. So you want it to be engaging. You don't want it to be overwhelming. And with that, I will end and we can just sort of open it up for any um, questions that you may have or um, I'm going to stop sharing. I have a question, if I may. Sure, please. Um, and we talked a lot about how to engage them in the online environment. And I think I've, I've, I've figured out to, to do this. I'm doing most of the things we're discussing, but now it flipped for me that I'm worried I'm not providing enough um, value um, in the classroom sections in terms of I have two graduate classes that are, that are hybrid, that uh, I see them face to face every once in a while. And, and um, so I'm worried these students come in 6.30 p.m. to 9.30 p.m. and think to themselves, why in the world could we have not done this virtually? All right, why did we need to come in face to face? I'm trying to combat it with role playing exercises and, and casework the best I can to engage them. But do you have any other strategies how I can, I can really show that I'm providing face to face value in a hybrid session? Um, that's a, a really good question. And I think every single person, probably across the country, teaching the way you're teaching is, is asking the same question. Um, I think one of the ways that I would do it too is first find out from your students, what do they want to get out of a face-to-face -face classes and say, what would help you be successful and maybe survey them and say, you, you do wanna provide th that as a time for them to connect with each other as much as possible. Um, but I think if you, if they know where you're coming from and you know where they're coming from and what they could get out of the face-to-face -face class, the added value it gets beyond what your, the online components of the class would be, that could help. Um, in some classes, I do think that graduate classes, sometimes 
you students are just saying all I want is the content give me what it is I need to know and I don't need to get it from um, a meeting with you makes it really hard to engage them in those those face-to-face -face classes where maybe you're trying to do something more applied maybe you're trying to have discussions um, you know so I, I do feel that that has been hard and I've also been hearing that people are seeing student um, attendance in some of those face-to-face -face classes dropping as the semester is going on you know there's a uh, in the chat about this from Monica and she says um, she describes face-to-face -face class to her students as I'm saying her sorry as to my students as being um, like bas baseball practice and I'm the coach they can do stuff on their own but face to face part of but the face to face part of hybrid is when I can provide more direct instruction so I think that that's the key like I I've, I've told my faculty this is valuable time if you get the opportunity to be face to face with the students in the classroom because a lot of my a lot of our students want to be face to face um, and so it's valuable time. So if, it's, if there is something that you are doing that can be put in the online environment, do that. But what are you gonna use that face-to-face -face time for that's gonna make them want to come? You know, use that time wisely. It's time for practice and engagement, mm -hmm. honestly. That's my take yeah. on it. And they have to feel like they're going to it with a purpose in mind that you, you wanna plan that the way you also are planning your, your online sessions. Um, you know, and I know it's difficult. Everyone is experiencing this sort of challenge of how to help students one, because you also want them to feel safe in that class, you know, so especially if they're coming to campus and I have seen, a, oh, go I have a question if you if you may allow me. Uh, first of all, thank you because I really enjoyed this presentation very insightful um, information. Uh, my question would be which is you know, with, with the virtue of being virtual, we do have uh, a lot of tools to leverage, which is a double-edged sword in that sense when we talk about incorporating those in our classes because we think about it from our perspectives as, as teachers or instructors, while if we change the view to a student when he's taking six or seven classes and each class has a separate system with a separate set of tools and mm -hmm. let's say i use three tools in my class and each class uses another three different tools they ended up to have to manage a slew of tools and technologies and getting acquainted with it and the time it takes for them to learn it and become proficient and at the time in having to do this virtually versus a face-to-face I had students complain about this. They say, oh, I, I start getting, getting confused. Should I post here? Should I do this? This class asked for that. So we should look into the student's perspective in that sense, which, uh, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of people discuss. What, what's your take on that? That's such a good point too. So I, there was just a webinar that the Chronicle had a few weeks ago. Um, there was a student from Rutgers and Rutgers actually uses multiple LMSs and that student had a classes in Canvas, Moodle, and I can't remember the other LMS, three classes in three different LMSs. So to me, like that was horrifying. So I definitely think it does help is if you, if, if there's a shared way that students know what to expect in an online course and there is research to support this. And so at GSU, we did an online teaching course for all faculty to go through and we said, there needs to be a welcome video that can be found in this space. Not because we want to tell you what to do for teaching, but because by having a common way this works, it reduces the cognitive load that I've seen people put in the chat and it increases students' confidence that they know where to find something. Um, so having at least some elements of consistency among classes, even at least within a department, that does help. Um, and I also think, you know, we showed you examples of all of these tools. If you were to adopt every single one of those, your students would be overwhelmed and you would be overwhelmed. Find a couple that work well for you um, and that you think your students can use. Um, because every time you adopt something new with technology, there's also a greater chance that it will not work. Right. You saw me in Zoom advancing slides for somebody else who you have advancing for Josie because of technology. And so we have to keep that in mind as well. So I do think simplicity helps and consistency helps with these elements. 
and maybe find a couple people you teach with in a similar way. Maybe if you're teaching an intro class, they're teaching the second semester, say, hey, how can we actually have a common framework for what this would look like for our students? I think that that is one approach that might be successful. Also, uh, I can't, I don't know who was speaking. Who was, I don't want to say your name, but uh, you know, I often say there's plenty in the LMS. There's plenty that we have in our LMS to do what we need to do. If you're going to choose another technology, like one that we've mentioned here, one is fine. Know that one. Use that one meaningfully and not just for the sake of using it. You know, use it in class if you're teaching face-to-face, -face, use it synchronous, use it as much as you can. And then when you see, okay, I've got the hang of this. I know all the troubleshooting I'm going to encounter next semester. Maybe I'll add one other tool. But when you are new to it, that's the best way to do it. One thing at a time. Um, plenty in the LMS already exists. There's, you know, there, there might be no need to go outside of what is there. And I always caution people about the fact that if your school, your institution does not support the tool, you know, and you use it, and that's fine, you have to sometimes become tech support for that tool. So you really do need to know it inside and out and all those little um, speed bumps that you're going to come across. Yeah. And Caitlin put, you know, some of these systems can be integrated into the LMS. And so some that we're adopting, like Perusa, will be integrated. I would never have students enter into something outside of the LMS. You would put the link in there because it needs to at least be one home for them. Yeah. But integrating them into the LMS. And, and we can't integrate every tool. So there could be something that doesn't easily integrate into your LMS as well. Something so. like Padlet, which is free for a limited amount, I understand, yeah. and still be embedded in the LMS yeah. and not bought and integrated in. Right. A good way to go as well. Put the link right in there, drop the link in. So. To my um, Hi, I'm actually the person who posted that. I actually oh, do you. integrate my Nearpods. Um, oh, that's into good. Mine. It's not integrated in the sense of what most people would think, but I actually am able to embed them in a file in the, um, D2L file way, you just embed it. And they can and so, advance, they can advance your Nearpod within the D2L frame? Yes. Love it. Love it. And so that's just one yeah. way I found that since they're not having to go out of the LMS system, they're a little bit more likely to do that. And you can still do the padlets in Nearpod as well. Uh -huh. So that's all part of it. So it's there's fun. a lot that's there. Thank you. Caitlin. Caitlin, thank you for sharing that. That's really good to know. So. And what it also shows is you guys can solve all of these, right? You know, you're working on solving this and sort of making, making this work for your class. A lot of the tools that we mentioned, I don't know who M Horn is. I don't know what your first name is, M. <laughs> but um, a lot, almost all the tools we mentioned are ADA yeah. compliant and have a right. uh, Marco. Hey, <laughs> um, and they, and I, you know, you, they do need to be compliant. Yeah. You know, uh, but um, every tool we mentioned, I believe is, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so thank you for um, saying that, uh, Marco, because class culture, everything must be ADA compliant. If you don't even set it up within that framework, then you've already eliminated an element of creating a positive class culture. So Marco, thank you for bringing up that point. So. We're, we're kind of over time. We're so far over, and I apologize that we went so far over you. time. I can yes. thank people in the, in the chat, so. so. Well, I figure we, the, the webinar ended right at about noon, and, and usually folks, some stick around for the Q&A, and some yeah. drift off as they need to go on, so. so. We appreciate you guys staying around for the extra Q&A. Sure, and if you guys have any questions, um, one of the things we forgot to include on the slides, Josie, are our email addresses, but you are welcome to um, email us. We will make sure Denise has our email addresses on the version that's posted. Um, and the, you know, if you've got questions, just please reach out to us. We're happy to, happy to help. And we wish you guys all a good rest of the semester. Um, and supporting your colleagues and your students getting through what will be a unique fall. Yeah, thanks, Laura, and thanks, Josie. Thank you. you guys are great, and thanks to all of you for participating today. And we'll see you next yeah. time. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thanks. Thank Have you a great so weekend. Much. Bye, everybody.